Military. Oh, this is my favorite thing to come up with in a world. Um, arms and armor. I have a previous video on armor, arms and armor, or at least armors. Oh no, weapons and armor. They're two separate videos, I believe. Um, detailing how they evolved and how they're used in the real world that might help you. If not, again, think about how. And this is also before. This is like kind of pre-gunpowder, or at the the videos only cover like from sort of antiquity or the classical period up until like the Renaissance. It doesn't really go too much into the gunpowder era or the industrial era, things like that. So just keep that in mind if you watch those videos. Uh, how exactly the arms and armor, uh, like what they use, for instance, again, if it's a desert people, you're probably not going to have them decked out in like medieval plate. You know, because on that you had the this this cloth called gambeson which is this thick cloth coat which you put metal plates over you really don't want to be fighting in that armor in a desert setting um again are they mostly cavalry cavalry based uh cavalry based uh if so they're probably going to be using they could be using heavy armor but you might also want to have um lighter armor people mixed in there because uh, again it's a lot of weight for uh human beings a lot of weight for a horse to carry but if you put a human being in armor and put the horse in armor, it's going to affect how far they can go. Because as strong as, again, if you're using kind of horses or anything like that, if you have like a made up uh, animal that can handle a huge amount of weight and can just go for days, it's not going to be too much of an issue. But again, that's something you're going to have to address at some point. Because most people, when they think of your story, that, that's something that's going to come to their mind because they're used to horses. They're used to like donkeys and oxen and, thing like, and things like that. Even though they don't know, they have a general idea. You know, if you're saying that your horse rode, if you have like a um, more realistic um, or a sci-fi fantasy, rather, is a better example. If you have like a sci-fi or fantasy um, a universe and they have a creature that can go for, uh, you know, three or four days straight and never gets tired, explain why they don't get tired. Uh, a little bit about their biology, you know. Uh and again, this is also going to be uh, also going to be based upon their um, the resources they have available. If they don't have a lot of uh, you know steel or iron from where they're at, that might stunt how well they form their military. Uh, so, say some other nation has some metal or some common metal used in arms and armor, and the nation you're writing from or a nation you're writing about doesn't have access to them they might have to uh have a different military uh their unit structured differently because they just don't have the materials that almost every other nation on on your world has uh same thing for weapons and things like that again geography is going to uh largely affect it for instance you look at the mongols again uh bedouin people uh you look at certain tribes of native americans they used monitored archers a lot uh, to various effect. You know, Huns used them as well. Sorry, I'm taking a drink of water. Huns used a lot of uh, monitored archers. Again, these are people that are, you know, steppe people or have these wide open spaces, you know, the plains of the, of the Americas, the wide open deserts of the Middle East, the steppes of Mongolia and things like that. Uh, are they, again, are they naval? Uh, are they primarily a navy? Um, so, if they're a navy, you're going to want weapons that are a little bit shorter in reach. You're not going again. You don't see many pirates with spears. You see them with these short cutlasses and things like that because ships tend to be very enclosed. This also works for um, space combat as well. Another good example from the 40k universe is that there's a lot of boarding between uh, spacecraft. Uh, people who fight off boarding actions or attempt boarding actions uh, will use different weapons because obviously you don't want to risk hull breaches. So they'll use kind of weaker weapons. Or not necessarily weaker weapons, but weapons that don't have as much penetration as the traditional weapons that they have because you're, you're defi trying to defend your ship, you're in the hallway, and you shoot a bunch of holes in the hull and everybody gets sucked down into space. Not great. Um, so do they use more melee weapons in this situation until they get deeper into the ship and they can use their primary weapons um, 
without with less worry. Things like that. Uh, tactics as well. Arms and armor really in, influence tactics as well. Um, for instance, uh, the Romans used a short sword along with a shield. Most militaries used pole arms, like spears, with their shields. But the Romans, you know, with how their arms and armor were, they decided that a short sword was a little bit better to use, and particularly the gladius, which is that sort of thick, pointed, uh, kind of almost looks like a, um, I don't know how to describe this. Uh, I mean, if you ever uh, look up a Roman gladius, you'll see the shape. It's it's really good for thrusting. I mean, you could hack with it, you could cut with it, but it's primarily good for thrusting because when you're in a formation, shoulder to shoulder with somebody, you can't have a sword that you that's primarily a cutting sword because you just don't have the room. You know, if you have a shield wall or formation, that formation is only as strong as its cohesion. Generally speaking, at least in uh, the real world, if a formation of a military uh, or a unit, you know, say it was a formation of 50 soldiers and they, it was poorly put together or broke, it very soon the entire, you know, if it broke in one spot, pretty soon that entire formation would break. You want to keep that cohesion. It's also why they use spears a lot and not a lot of cutting weapons because spears you can just kind of thrust back and forth without, without an issue. If you have a cutting weapon like a saber, you know, you'd have to, or like a katana, you, you know, not that not the Japanese necessarily fought shield walls, but if you had a, a curved blade that was primarily for hacking and slashing, you can't really do that in a formation because the, you have a guy next to you, and you know if, they're, if everybody's right-handed or uh, holding the weapons in the right hand, you're gonna have the guy to your right. So you can't really do that. There has to be some sort of thrusting weapon. Um, if it's futuristic again, the guns. How much ammo? Like what is what is the ammo that it fires? What's the effect of that ammo? Is it actually using? Um, solid projectiles or is it lasers, plasma, things like that? How is the ammo stored? Um, how much, you know, what's the range? What's the power on it? You know, if you have like a plasma weapon, you know, if that can go through, you know, a plasma rifle that can go through a tank hull but can't pierce infantry body armor, one, that doesn't make any sense, and two, if so, why is it that way? Uh, and this also goes to the arms and armor, like with vehicles. If it's futuristic, you know, if it's, uh, you know, kind of fantasy, you have chariots, you have, you know, war elephants, things like that. You have uh, various ships, like are these like these massive floating fortress ships, um, kind of like some, like some of how the uh, Chinese would make, um, or is it, like, you know, does the Navy uh, favor huge kind of capital ships, for lack of a better term, for both fantasy and sci-fi, although it makes more sense for sci-fi, and have smaller ships to support it? Or is it just have, like, kind of a lot of medium ships and not a lot of larger capital ships, if that's what they prefer? So things like that. And again, a if you're going to have a landlocked uh, civilization, they probably shouldn't have a strong naval tradition. If it's an island nation, it probably should have a strong naval tradition. Uh, and also, how do they feel? How does how does the civilization, the tactics, how do they feel about certain tactics? Another good example from the Romans: the Romans didn't really like naval warfare. They thought they thought it was kind of a lower form of warfare. Um, you know, you always hear about whatever you study, or anybody ever had to study uh, Roman history, you hear about the generals a lot. You don't really hear a lot about the admirals because the Romans kind of had a navy because they had to have it. Um, they didn't really like it much. They didn't think highly of it. So that also would have affect the strategies. The Japanese in general didn't use a lot of shields. They did use shields earlier on, but later on they kind of viewed them as more of a cowardly thing to use shields. So they just didn't use them. Uh, at least uh, infantry type shields. They did have these large kind of um, mobile shields, which are essentially just walls that archers would uh, take cover behind and fire from. Uh, the Spartans as well didn't use didn't use bows and arrows because they thought it was a coward's weapon. Uh, so these are things to kind of uh, think about. How was the army formed? Essentially, where do they get it from? Is it force conscription? Um, you know, is it whenever there's a war, there's a draft. Um, certain times, uh, certain periods in history, 
there were no real standing armies. A lot of uh, tribes and civilizations didn't have standing armies. They only formed armies whenever there was um, some sort of conflict. Uh, also, by the way, if you have a standing army, you're going to have to factor into your economy because standing army is more expensive than to have an army that you form every time there's... Because stand, with a standing army, you have to maintain them. If it's an army you form every time there's conflict, you only have to maintain them for as long as the conflict lasts. Uh, you know, again, is it standing army and then conscripts as well? Is it a required military service? An example is South Korea and Israel. Uh, everybody has to, with some exceptions, obviously, um, has to uh, enter into a period of uh, required military service. I believe the Swiss have to as well. I'm not sure. Uh, what is your organizational structure? What are your ranks? You know, private, corporal, sergeant, lieutenant, captain, major, you know, so on and so forth. Are there made up ranks like, you know, squire? Or not necessarily made up ranks, but kind of different ranks, I should say. Ranks that are not as recognizable. Like, are you, um, you know, a sword bearer, and then you go up to, um, I don't know, a squire knight, and then knight, then uh, lord, lord commander, lord marshal, you know what I mean, things like that. Are there different ranks? You know, what? Hold on, I got my dog out. Right, Zoe? You gonna say hi? You gonna make me, gonna make me look like a fool, huh? You gonna say hi? Say hi. Say hi. Okay, I guess not. Go ahead, girl. Uh, what kind of units do they have? Again, uh, if it's like a fantasy, you know, you, you're going to have infantry, light infantry, heavy infantry, light cavalry, heavy cavalry. You're going to have siege weapons, things like that. Um, if you're looking more towards a uh, Renaissance, or not Renaissance, but like an industrial era, kind of if you're thinking around like the 1600s or 1700s, uh, even the, really more around the 1400s as well. Any time where there were cannons, you're going to have, you know, cannon divisions, things like that, or cannon units. You're going to have gunpowder units in addition. You're going to have crossbowmen, archers, mounted archers, things like that. What kind of units th does your army use? Uh, equipment. And I'm not talking about weapons and armor. We've already went through that. But equipment, like, for instance, what do they carry? Do they carry a bedroll? Do they carry their water? What food do they eat? How do they keep their food? Is their food transported on like wagon trains or trucks and things like that? Or do the soldiers carry all their food on them as well? And the other, you know, the kind of the wagon trains and the trucks are only for resupplied or resupplies. Again, how are they supplied? Whenever you have a military, especially if it's invading, it's going to have a supply line. How does it do that? Is it, again, by wagon train? Are they supplied by forging? Um, in country, uh, William Tecumseh Sherman during the Civil War, because he had to move quickly, he got almost all of his supplies by foraging uh, across the southern states, uh, the southern countryside. Also, foraging was used if your supply line was cut, or just even if you had an intact supply line, it was used to supplement it. Um, if you, for instance, if it's, um, say you have a civilization. And it's surrounded by a bunch of tribes that are allied with your civilization, and then you have the enemy army. Uh, are you supplied by your allied tribes? This is also something you might want to think of, or allied planets and things like that. How exactly is that handled? How is it maintained? You don't necessarily have to describe this, but it could be useful if, say, one of the conflicts is your supply lines are cut. You're going to have to explain how supplies get to you eventually if you're going to describe how it's. Uh, how it is um, resolved, or how, it was, how the problem was caused to begin with. I think I explained this in my uh, tact, uh, my um, previous uh, arms and armor um, videos. But a good way to a uh, good way to deal with a large army, or any army for that matter, but especially if your army is outnumbered, is to cut supplies to the uh, army, especially if they're invading. Um, Napoleon, I'm not sure Napoleon said, but it's, it's mostly attributed to Napoleon, an army marches on its stomach. All right, no matter how well trained, no matter how well equipped your arm, uh, the enemy is, or some army is, if they're all starving, you know, starvation often, almost always leads to disease. 
So if they're sick and starving, they're not going to be that effective. And at that point, the numbers actually work against them because they need they have so many more people to feed than you do who has a smaller force, especially if you're in your home nation defending it. You know where to find the food. The enemy doesn't. So supplies are always important, but they can also create conflict and conflict resolution. What are the strengths and weaknesses of the army? Again, um, Roman... Uh, the Romans, for instance, did not have great cavalry. Most of their cavalry, I mean, they sometimes did have great cavalry, but that cavalry was almost always um, cavalry from allied tribes. So Germanic cavalry, Numidian cavalry, things like that. Again, they didn't have that great of a navy. Um, but their heavy infantry, which was their main, the legionnaires, were very, very good at what they did. They were very well disciplined, things of that nature. Um... They also had a lot of agency in, in how um, kind of the underlings and kind of the secondary. For instance, a centurion can make decisions in battle, um, you know, as the battle evolved. So that could be something that can work in people's favor. You know, it, it can lead to a dynamic battlefield where your junior officers can accurately respond or quickly and effectively respond to the changing battlefield. Or it can work against you because they can make mistakes and screw everything up. Vice versa, if you have uh, junior officers that strictly adhere to what the units, uh, what the commanding officers uh, decide, that's also another problem. One of the issues that the Germans had during the D-Day invasions is that unlike the American or the Allied soldiers where they were given a lot of, well, I don't know about the other Allied, but at least the American soldiers were given a lot of, the junior officers were given a lot of agency, the German, the German commander was very strict, you know, you didn't do anything until a superior officer commanded you to do it. That was one of the issues that they had and one of the reasons they failed to properly defend um, the French countryside from the Allies. Is that American troops would get together and be like, okay, who's the commanding officer? Let's do it. Okay. While German officers say, well, we have a problem. We can't do anything without our commanding officer say so. Strength and, weak strength and weaknesses like that. Again, geography strongly affects many of these factors. As I said before, if, you're, if your civilization occupies wide open spaces, it's going to be, generally speaking, a lot of cavalry. If it's island nation, a lot of navy. All right. A culture. Um, ethnic groups, for instance. You, again, uh, you know, in America, we have different, you know, most uh, Western nations, we have a wide variety of ethnic groups. But again, if it's, if it's a fantasy or sci-fi, you know, how do these particular ethnic groups, what what is sort of their the core? Like what you know, kind of what are they all about? For instance, dwarves in fantasy often are mountain dwelling and uh, are smiths. They like forging. They're very good at forging weapons and armor, things like that. Um, you know, when we think of Vikings, we think of somewhat erroneously as savage, barbaric. You know, rapers and pillagers, you know, again, the, the big joke with the Irish is that they're hard drinkers, things like that. Uh, so ethnic groups, again, the, the different, I'm not all those are ethnic groups I'm aware of, but just like some examples. So you, you want to kind of think of something that an, an ethnic group is kind of known for and what's kind of core to their belief. Again, religion will play a big part of this. Some ethnic groups are could be or are more religious than others. Um, and if there is a religion, how much of that religion plays into each ethnic group? Uh, what is their language? You know, what kind of, do they have, do they share a large, or do they share an alphabet with the majority of the world? Again, most of the world uses kind of the basic 26 letter alphabet, you know, you know, France uses it, you know, the, you know French uses it, German, English, so on and so forth. Almost all of them use the basic uh, 26 letter off, but I can't remember what it's called off the top of my head. But then you have the Slavic countries use Cyrillic, which is a different alphabet altogether. Then you have kind of characters, you know, Kanji, Romaji, things like that, um, that are they're completely different. Obviously, the, the uh, Asian. Uh, alphabets completely different from like Western and even Middle Eastern alphabets, things like that. I'm not too knowledgeable on Middle Eastern alphabets, so forgive me, forgive my ignorance. But again, 
how, how do they all share the same al alphabet? Do they have different alphabets? Do some of them share the same alphabet and some of them differ, so on and so forth? You don't have to create your own language specifically, but it might be something you want to add into there being like, you know, characters like, I can't read this. It's in blank's language. It's in the blank alphabet. Or if it's like they're reading a, a different language in their alphabet, being like, well, I can kind of, I can somewhat translate this to a certain extent if I had enough time, so on and so forth. Or if the language share a com, uh, you know, kind of a, a common um, root language. Um, for instance, Flemish and Dutch share a common uh, language. So you can kind of, like, again, South African too, um, there is a, MMA fighter, he's a Dutch MMA fighter, he was talking about, you know, like different people and things like that. He's like, you know, I can kind of, you know, with my Dutch, I can kind of talk to people from South Africa and kind of understand them, things like that. Um, you know, words, certain words are shared across multiple languages that have the same root. So that's something to think about. Art, you know, again, not something you necessarily have to think about, but it might help. Um, I have to say culture is probably the least important of everything here. Not saying that culture is unimportant in the grand scheme of things, but in terms of world building, it's probably not something you want to focus too heavily on um, just because it doesn't come up as often unless you want it to. You know, art, are they sculptors? Are they painters? Are they musicians? Are they um, actors and playwrights? Are they writers? Things like that. Something that helps flush things out and make your world more real. Uh, food, what do they eat? Again, island nations generally have a lot more seafood. Uh, you know, more farmers will have, a, a, you know, depending on what they farm, that'll, you know, if you have a lot of apple farmers and straw, you know, people that farm a lot of apples or they're known for their apples, you're probably not going to have a bunch of people running around with cantaloupes. You know what I mean? Because they're two different biomes, things like that. Uh, so that's something you want to think about. Uh, if the culture is vegetarian, obviously, there's not going to be a lot of hamburgers and steaks. Um, some, uh, something more to think about. Now, overview. These aspects intertwine with one another, so if you're having trouble with one, focus on another. It'll help you if you run into trouble. Again, if you're like, I don't fucking know what the army does. I can't think of anything at the time. Go back. Think about the geography. Or, uh, let's see, what's the other thing? You know, think about the religion, think about the economy, um, think about the political structure, things like that. So, uh, for instance, if you're having trouble with culture, start developing religion. Uh, same thing with the political structure. And, you know, mostly a political structure, culture, and religion are very closely tied together a lot of the time. So if you're having trouble, like, I don't know what the political structure is, think about the religion. Um, try to come up, uh, try to flesh out the religion. If you're having trouble with religion, think about the political structure. Think about the culture. Flesh those out a little bit more, and that'll help you. If you're trying to think about the economy, again, geography helps there. You know, if it's a really mountainous region, you're going to have a lot of metals. You're going to have a lot of mining. Uh, military, again, same thing. Um, maybe your military is, uh, maybe the military is ruled by the religious or the religion of your civilization, you know, or maybe you have the, the religion has its own military wing while the, uh, civilization has its own. So say the King has his own army, but the religion, let's say worshipia, the religion of worshipia or whatever that it has its own forces. Maybe that might cause some tension. And then you have a political structure there. You have a, you, you it flushes out the political structure. Um, things like that. So you want to think about one, if you're having trouble with one, try to think about the others. Uh, so if you, again, I'm repeating myself here. Uh, sorry, I'm, uh, my throat's incredibly dry at this point. Uh, if you're having trouble with one aspect of the uh, civilization, think about the other aspects. And by filling in those blanks, it'll help you with the one you're having trouble with. So that's going to... Uh, a well-built wool will make writing easier and providing a strong framework. It'll make creating conflicts and resolutions of those conflicts more organic. Again, if you think about um, Game of Thrones, there's a little bit of a spoiler for the 
the show and the books uh, up until about season three or four or whatever, or maybe even five and six, just the whole series in general. Um, I'm, I'll give you about five seconds, and then if you want to click off, that's fine. But a bit of a spoiler coming. Okay, in Game of Thrones, there is an event called the Red Wedding in which Rob Stark, uh, the ruling king of the north, is killed. And somebody that could possibly take the reins of uh, the Stark household is Jon Snow, who is a bastard sent up to the wall. Now, if you're on the wall, if you're with uh, the people man the wall called the Night's Watch, again, I'm speaking this as if you don't know. Most of you who do know already know the answer to this. So I'm going to try to speak, I'm trying to use layman, layman terms here. If you're in the Night's Watch, you forsake any titles you have, so you can't become king. And also, being a bastard, he wasn't legitimized. So even if he takes the castle, he may not have, he may not be recognized as a rule. Because George R. R. Martin made that world, made that stipulation as world already, that conflict is already set up. You don't have to do anything about it. Uh, another example in Warhammer 40K, and I'm using a lot of examples I already know, because obviously I don't want to get into like the, uh, you know, I don't know anything about Star Trek, so I'm not going to use many examples from Star Trek. In Warhammer 40K, the way they, they do fast and light travel is going through a psychic realm, essentially hell, called the Warp. A lot of ships get lost in the Warp, and it's not necessarily... Time gets really weird in the Warp, so you may... Th the journey may normally take you two months, but you end up popping out five years later. This is another issue if you want something bad to happen, like a world being besieged by an enemy and you want something bad to happen, you can say that in fast light travel, the fleet got lost or popped out somewhere it wasn't supposed to be or popped out five years too late. Things like that. By making these the framework of the world, you automatically create conflicts. You can automatically create solutions to these conflicts. For instance, you know, a lot of times in sci-fi uh, and sometimes fantasy, there's this idea of like this hive mind or whatever, these kind of hyper-evolved creatures. Think Zerg from StarCraft, Tyranids from uh, Warhammer 40k. Kind of think of the um, the Knight's King from uh, Game of Thrones. Again, more Game of Thrones spoilers. But when you have this one leader that's kind of like this hive mind and you kill them, then everybody else, then all the other um, underlings that are controlled by them die and things like that. If you set that up ahead of time, boom, you already have the solution. Now all it is is how you get to that point. It uh, makes your world feel more real and helps the reader become more immersed. Subconsciously, the reader will start to fill in the blanks, and it helps them a lot more if you can, like for instance, if you know that people is, that people are very art-oriented, and you kind of describe the things, you know, having art and colors and music on every street and, and street performers performing these small plays and everything's vibrant with these colors. Everything is beautiful. The reader will eventually start to develop in their head naturally your world. And may, you may not even have to describe it past that point. They'll make the whole world in their head already. So you don't have to worry about it at that point. Uh, also, if you are very vague, it's hard for a reader to get interested in there because there's a constant feeling, okay, like, oh, um, what? Uh.